Dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon, or for some people, maybe it's good morning, or for some people, it's maybe late uh, evening. All welcome to the School for Young Scientists. It's uh, four, fifth and the last but not least day of the school. We, together with uh, Professor Gelfan, co-chair, are greeting you on this day. Professor Gelfan, you could also say a couple of words. <laughs> um, I'm happy that uh, you, Professor Andrea Sam, that you agreed to give a lecture for us. And of course, it's very valuable for our students and for, for me also, for us also, <laughs> for all organizers. Thank you very much. Exactly. I share this opinion. So today we continue with three lectures. These will be uh, given uh, now. And we start with the lecture from Professor Andreasian. Very briefly, Professor Faskian Andreasian uh, is a director of hydrological uh, unit in the, uh, it was a but now it's called differently because there was a merger in uh, France and he could say maybe several words on this. He is a very well-known hydrologist and uh, uh, a lot of work in various areas of hydrology, especially forest hydrology. And he is recipient of various awards and uh, active uh, member of the hydrological uh, uh, community. So Professor Andreasian, floor is yours. So we have 45 minutes for the lecture and 15 minutes for questions. Thank you. Very good. So the only difficult thing to start with would be to, to success in sharing my screen and I hope to succeed. And if I succeed, yes, we see your screen. Yes, you, you can did see succeed. my screen. Yeah, if you do full screen, then. And please note your face is also seen in the top right corner of the screen to all participants on YouTube. Okay. So, um, thank you for being here. Thank you for. Um, taking this time to, to listen to a, to a poor French hydrologist who, are going, who is going through so many mergers that he does not know anymore to which institute he belongs. Um, so, as you mentioned, um, uh, Professor Gelfand, Professor Solomatin, I am um, a hydrologist working in a research institute called INRAE. INRAE is a French um, Agricultural Research Institute and our institute, IRSTEA, was recently merged with INRAE. So we, we used to be very um, critis, critical uh, to agriculture up to now uh, concerning water pollution. And now we, we forgot everything we, we used to say and, and say, and we are only seeing benefits in in agriculture, fertilizer, and so on. Um, this was a joke, of course, and I'm not going to, to address uh, issues of pollution. I'm going to address um, an issue relative to simple methods to, um, to analyze the sensitivity of stream flow to climate. It seems to me that it is a very basic um, issue in hydrology and an issue that should be of interest for for many uh, hydrologists and for, especially for young scientists and I, I hope that this presentation will give them a slightly different um, look at um, at the type of analysis that can be made. So this presentation was entitled uh, Assessing the elasticity of stream flow to climate. Why did I the word elasticity? First of all, I think it's important to, to precise that. Elasticity is a word that we uh, use in economy. At least that's where I, uh, I learned it first. Or in physics. So, in physics, we all know about springs and about the elasticity of springs and how they react to different weights. Yes. And in economics, 
elasticity is a measurement of how responsive an economic variable is to a change. Um, and if you have been through uh, economics classes, you have probably heard about the price elasticity of demand, the price elasticity of supply. Um, basically, it's a sensitivity of the price to the amount that is brought to the market or the uh, sensitivity of the price to the supply. And basically, that's what uh, it is. Elasticity is a kind of sensitivity. And more precisely, it's uh, a relative sensitivity. And why did we call um, sensitivity elasticity? Oh, basically, it's, it's, a, it's an American uh, hydrologist, a well-known American hydrologist, uh, John Shackey, who started to use these words. And I guess that his first paper was uh, uh, 30 years ago. Um, that's when he started to, to use this word. And, you know, like um, many things, um, many f it, it became a fashion. fashion and I, I followed the fashion. Of course, um, we hydrologists, um, and especially the Russian hydrologists, like complex hydrological models. And there is... Of course, they, they, they are extremely interesting, but they have one problem, they are, they are complex. And I believe that any analysis of the natural environment of, catchment, uh, of catchments should not start from the most complex, um, with the most complex approach. We, we could start also with extremely simple approaches that we could, um, then uh, complexifies uh, if needed. And if we look for simpler methods than the complex models that um, hydrologists like to build, uh, one of the questions I like to ask is uh, how could we could make use of the experiments that nature itself is performing on catchments? We often say that one, one of the difficulty of um, hydrology is that we cannot perform controlled experiments. Uh, control experiments on porosity, on, um, on infiltration can be made in um, laboratories, of course, but at the catchment scale, at the, at the scale that is of interest uh, for us, um, it's very difficult to, to make any um, experiment. However, however, nature is doing repeatedly experiments. Every year we have drought years, we have wet years, and nature is performing its experiments, and there is much to be learned from it. This is, of course, not new. Everybody, everybody, you, you must have heard in, in your classes that uh, to, to characterize the behavior of a catchment of a region, we need to analyze long time series. And in these long time series, there must be um, dry, dry years, wet years. And only if a catchment have, has been through these um, different events, and if you have been able to, to follow it, to, to monitor it, only at that, at that time you can consider that you are um, you have understood or you are able to grasp the, the, the full behavior of the catchment. But for example, um, we, we are so often uh, asked about the consequence of climate change. Uh, what will happen tomorrow uh, in a warmer climate? What, how will the rivers react? How will water resources evolve? And it happens that, that nature performed that, is, it, uh, that kind of experiment. And, and one very good example was uh, what was ca called the Millennium Drought in Australia. And the Millennium Drought, why, well, why was it called the Millennium? Because it was around the year 2000. And it lasted for, uh, for 
12 to 13 years from 1997 to 2009. And climatologists uh, can tell us that this uh, period was equivalent to the worst case 2050 scenario as predicted by climate models. So one of, for if you are an, hydro, uh, an Australian hydrologist and if you are asked what will happen in 2050, it's relatively easy, you could say. Uh, I can have a look at uh, the millennium drought and see how um, water system, catchment system uh, evolved, reacted, and I will be able to give a prediction. If you are looking at um, in the sile, um, these are on this on, on this plot. I present the sile precipitation anomalies um, from in the uh, 20th century and at the beginning of the 21st century, and we can see that we have had well known uh, very long dry periods uh, from the 70s to to very recently, and those very long dry periods can inform us also on how the system will uh, react to a drier climate to, to because uh, presently for the Sahel also climatic models predict drier periods. And so one of the questions I, I would like to analyze in this presentation is, uh, is could we derive reliable predictions concerning future climate hydrological changes directly from hydrological data without any modeling assumptions and with some assessment of the uncertainty of our prediction? Of course, uh, without modeling is an exaggeration. Uh, without any model and without any assumptions, we cannot, we can only describe the past. But with minimal modeling assumptions, with minimal models, uh, perhaps we could do something uh, wherever we have long time series that we are able to analyze. And a secondary question, if I have time, because as a rule, I always, I am always too, too slow to speak and I speak too much. If I have time, I will also address the question, uh, could we do the same with simple water balance formulas? Um, so let's now um, go a little in, in the detail of this elasticity, sensitivity, that uh, I propose to compute directly from long time series of, of climate and um, stream flow uh, data. So elasticity, I told you that it, it is defined uh, in economy um, as a relative, um, as, as, as um, in, in a linear model uh, between anomalies, between anomalies of the climate climatic variable here in my, um, in, in my equation, it is x. And so you, you have the, the relative anomaly, delta x is uh, the relative change between what you observe during a year or during a series of year and the average, and x bar is the average. So this is what to, uh, climatologists usually call anomaly. And here, um, because I am a surface hydrologist, I will um, only uh, talk about stream flow. Uh, it is the, the anomaly of stream flow on the same uh, time period. And epsilon, epsilon here is the, what we call elasticity, the elasticity coefficient. So epsilon is, it is a non-dimensional quantity because it, it's percent by percent. Or already the two 
quantities were non-dimensional. Um, and if you are a, a lazy, las, lazy hydrologist and you want to, you, you don't want to use anomalies, you, uh, uh, relative anomalies, you can also look at the absolute anomalies and you will, again, if you, if you have a quantity that is expressed, for example, in millimeter per year on this side and in millimeter per year on this side, you will again get a sensitivity that will be um, uh, expressed in non-dimensional way. It's exact. It's it's entirely equivalent, of course. It's it's just a, a way to to show that there are there are two ways to to compute these anomalies in. Um, and you can choose whatever uh, wh whatever quantity is the most inter interesting for for you. If here in this presentation, I am only focusing on precipitation and potential evaporation. So both quantities can be expressed in millimeter per year, and stream flow. Um, if I divide it by area, I can again express it in um, millimeter per year. And so I can use any, um, in, in, any of these, uh, uh, either this equation or the previous equation. If I wanted to use, um, for example, temperature uh, in degrees Celsius, then I could I will not have a non-dimensional ratio here uh, linking stream flow and temperature. And then for temperature, of course, it's much better to use this representation before if you have non-dimensional ratio. Um, and basically on this um, on, on this slide, I, I show the two the two possibility the two possibilities. The true elasticity, according to the de to the definition, is the, the above one, so epsilon. It's the, the, the person change of stream flow, Q, which is related to the person change of any climate variable, X. And uh, you can also have something that that is not really an elasticity. It's 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 a sensitivity. Um, here, millimeter change of stream flow Q by millimeter change of climate variable X. It really depends on, on, on what you feel more comfortable with. And um, the good thing with this very, very simple model is that you can have a very simple graphical representation um, and elasticity plot. And uh, if you look in the literature, by the way, uh, John Shackey had, uh, had presented those uh, for a very long time. Uh, this is an, a yield change graph that 40 years ago he had, he had published um, with uh, Emets and on the sensitivity of water resource systems to climate variation. So uh, already he was using these plots with the uh, relative change of runoff um, as a function of the relative change of precipitation. And there are also all other uh, re, um, American uh, hydrologists who published you, you, using these plots. These times the change in precipitation in millimeters and the change in runoff in millimeters. So it's, it, those are extremely widely widely used plots uh, that are interesting to, to visualize the data we have uh, from our catchments. And here are the kind of um, sensitivity or elasticity plots that I propose to, to draw to characterize um, a catchment. Um, the first plot here on the left-hand side is a plot showing um, the sensitivity of the uh, discharge uh, change 
uh, changes, discharge, discharge anomaly, as a function of the precipitation anomaly. So, uh, what can we see? And each point, each point represents the average value of both stream flow and precipitation over a rather long period. And I will discuss a little later why, um, why it is useful to, to use average over long periods and why it, it may be a little dangerous at some time or um, to, to use um, annual data. Of course, we, we, all, I, we all agree that we, we cannot use this kind of plot for, for daily uh, or hourly data. It will not make sense. We need to aggregate um, things over a, a given period. And I would say that the minimum period to aggregate will be the, the annual time step. And, and of course, uh, depending on the, the kind of hydrology of the region, we, kind of region, uh, we, we should use, uh, probably it will make more sense to use hydrological years than to use calendar years. Um, especially in, in place where, where snow is an important part of the, of the input to the catchment. Uh, we want to have the snow accumulation and snow melt in the same, uh, hydrological year, obviously. And so, Let's come to this uh, left-hand plot where I have the sensitivity of uh, discharge to precipitation. Uh, it's of course, uh, it's a French catchment. And what can we see? We can see that we have um, a relationship, a positive relationship. So the more uh, precipitation, the more discharge. So it's a, it's a very satisfying relationship for hydrologists. It's what we all learn. The more it rains, uh, the more, uh, the more uh, water flow in our uh, rivers. So it's, it's very logical. Uh, and the slope here can, can be analyzed to characterize the, the way uh, that the catchment as a, as a kind of filter transforms precipitation into uh, stream flow. The second plot here in the middle is a plot uh, showing uh, how discharge, uh, um, discharge anomalies can be related to potential evaporation anomalies. So I'm not going to, to, to enter, to, to discuss in details uh, how potential evaporation here is computed. Potential evaporation is it should be, um, it's an input of many models, but it's, we need itself a model or a formula to, to compute it. It's, it's an abstract um, con concept, but an, an abstract concept that, that tells us um, how much energy there is available to um, evaporate uh, water. And, um, of course, of course, uh, here we have, an, we, we have, we see first that there is um, um, a relationship which is much, which is not as clear as the previous one, but that is a relationship which is negative. It means that the more energy you have um, avail available to evaporate, the less uh, stream flow you, you get. And again, this is something very, um, very obvious for hydrologists. And so we, we are happy to, to see that, that kind of plot. Um, and the last, um, the, the, the last plot that we could do would be um, adding color and um, putting how the three, um, um, Grandeur, um, the three, uh, the three variables cover, cover, cover with each other. And here I present you a plot on the right hand side of how precipitation, uh, anomalies, evaporation, potential evaporation anomalies and, um, 
um, discharge anomalies covary. Here, of course, because I have only two, two dimensions for a tri-dimensional plot, I use colors to show, uh, to show how things go. And, and the interesting thing here is first to see that um, one of the difficulties of this analysis is that um, there, is, uh, there is a link between precipitation anomalies and evapotranspiration anomalies, at least in this uh, catchment, in this data set. Um, the driest year, years are also the warmest. Uh, this is what we see here. And then we can see what is the cumulative um, impact of both dr drought, uh, lack of, of rainfall, lack of precipitation, sorry, and uh, warmth, um, larger uh, um, potential evaporation. Um, and they have a combined effect uh, that becomes apparent here with the, with the colors uh, that are, um, that represent the, um, discharge anomalies. So here we can see the, the three type of plots that I was discussing on, 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 mini, on, on, on mini plots. And of course, I should have used these larger plots to, to make things more uh, easier to follow. So um, here, I can. I wanted to show you that it is um, possible, of course, to vary the averaging periods. As I told you, the the, the plots that I showed you up to now were those were, were here. There were plots uh, presenting average values of aver uh, averaged over ten years, and. Of course, if we want to go towards more long-term behavior, we should average over longer periods of time. Um, and here at the bottom, you have, excuse me, at the bottom, you have the, um, um, the representation with average of over 20 years, 20 year periods. And at the top, you have averages, uh, which are uh, where each point represent a different year. And um, yes, and here we understand why uh, we are not that much interested in um, having very long averaging periods, uh, just because between very long periods, we have very little variability. We will need extremely uh, long time series to be able to get more variability. And so, because my, in, with these plots, my interest lies in, in trying to extrapolate it and try to answer to a question, what will happen in 10, 20 or 30 years? I am interested in seeing a trend that I could try to extrapolate. Uh, here in the, at the bottom line, I don't see any trends because I don't have enough variability. Um, here with 10 years, I had more variability. With averages of a five year period, I have even more variability. Um, trends remain more or less the same, but I have more variability. And here on annual periods, on annual, um, at the annual time step, I have even more variability. And because the scales of each plot are the same, uh, it's easy to, 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 to see that there are much more variability uh, with the uh, annual time period. However, however, when we when we look at annual data, then then we we get into other problems uh, problems of uh, storage. It's from when we get the, all those points, it they it becomes difficult to consider that they are completely independent. There is some carryover storage from one year to the other. And after all, we should not um, forget that catchments have some memory, memory carried, of course, by, by the aquifers. And it's difficult to 
um, it, it, the memory effect introduces difficulties to, inter to interpret those plots. So, so they can still be drawn and analyzed and they, and they are useful, but, but uh, the averaged uh, plots are a little easier to interpret. That's, uh, that's a point that uh, I wanted to, to remind. I'm already talking for almost half an hour, so it's too much, but I will try to... Um, um, Professor Gelfand or Professor Solomatin, you will, you will tell me uh, to stop at, at some point, I, I guess. When, when you see that the, the students are, are getting yeah. sleepy, you sure. please tell uh, me well, to stop. But, uh, we have 45 minutes because we have to respect the schedule. There yes. are other like we we'll be giving a lecture, so... Uh, just uh, we could of course I will remind you of course but please watch the uh, clock. Yeah. I'm watching time and and also if will will students uh, ask have time to ask questions? Yes, we have a total forty five minutes for the lecture, okay. so it should stop at one thirty, and then we have fifteen minutes for questions. Great. Um, here, I wanted to show you um, after showing you the details of this as. Um, sensitivity analysis, elasticity analysis on, on one catchment. Um, I sh wanted to show you um, a, a synthesis over the French territory. So you might uh, recognize France, which looks like some hexagon. And uh, we have, of course, uh, a large number of gauge catchments in France. And here the, it's a selection of little more than 500 uh, French catchments spread all over the territory. So we have um, very temperate areas here near the Atlantic Ocean. We have more um, snowy area here with the Alps, the Jura, the Vosges, etc. So it's a var variety of catchments. And basically what we did is we, we repeated we drawed all these elasticity plots for all the catchments and computed um, the linear elasticities between averaged on, on 10 year periods uh, um, between discharge and precipitation, discharge and evapor potential evapotranspiration. Okay, so of course. I, I told you, I, had, I, I said that I was going to a no-model approach, and of course, there is no no-model approach in hydrology. There is always some minimalist model needed to quantify changes and allow predictions. So, as um, the minimalist uh, model, I used the uh, linear regression. Linear regression, you all know what it is. It's... Uh, this is a linear regression of the discharge anomaly on the precipitation anomaly, uh, and here the elasticity coefficient. And so you can do it one, on one variable at a time or with several variables at a time. So, and then there are small uh, distinctions. You can do uh, ordinary last square, least squares, generalized least square and independently or simultaneously. And basically, I'm not going to enter into details, but it's, it's rather uh, easy to explain. I mentioned that there was some correlation between the precipitation anomalies and the evapotranspiration anomalies, at least in France, in the climatic zones that I've studied, uh, the driest years are often the warmest one. And um, and because of this um, correlation between the independent variables, so the independent variables are not really in completely independent, so it is very important to use bivariate regression. So it's, it's for all those of, of you that have a little experience in, 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 in linear regression, it's something completely obvious. Just uh, want to wanted to to remind you of that, uh, and this co this covariation between precipitation and evapotranspiration, which I 
previously mentioned is obvious is is obvious on those plots and it it uh, it just uh, require a special a special a special treatment and here if i show you the the results of the uh, of this application of the generalized application of uh, the French territory here, um, I can present you two maps. So, um, so we computed the elasticities uh, to potential evaporation and to precipitation simultaneously, so in bivariate uh, regressions, and we obtain that kind of results that we will then try to interpret. So, the, the first thing that you should notice is that there are um, uh, colors and there are on, on circles and there are small crosses. Uh, the small crosses show um, those catchments for which we identified the regression as uh, non-significant. So the, the relationship was non-significant. And here, something that, that is good to, to comment on uh, from the beginning is that we have a lot of um, places where uh, the elasticity um, um, computed on potential evapotranspiration was not um, um, significant, but uh, on the other side, on almost all pla places, all cat for all, all cl uh, catchments, the elasticity to precipitation was uh, significant. It means that annual variation, annual or multi-annual variations of discharge are first of all conditioned by um, the variability of precipitation and only to a much minor extent by the variability of potential evaporation. Uh, transpiration. Um, so it seems for many hydrologists it, it will seem something obvious. If anybody asks you uh, what makes uh, uh, that a river will flow more this year than the previous year, you will tell you will tell uh, there is more there was more precipitation. Uh, the second thing that is um, very interesting also to note is something again obvious is that the elasticity coefficient is almost always negative for potential evapotranspiration and almost always, posi uh, always positive for precipitation. Again, this is obvious. The more precipitation, the more uh, discharge. And here there are, of course, when you, when you deal with a lot of data, there are all, always one or two outliers. So uh, we can discuss later what, what these outlier, outliers mean. Uh, but obviously it is, um, uh, it is something, um, it's, it's some, a, I, I just, it's, it will be cheating to hide the outlier. So I left them. And, and then the third question that we, we could be interested to, um, to analyze here will be uh, the intensities. Uh, now, this, the, the numerical values um, um, of the elasticities, they are much higher in some area and much lower in, in other area. And here, uh, here it's, it is not that obvious. It depends on the quality of your screen. And on, on my screen, knowing the geology of France, I do recognize some general patterns of on the geology that um, places with little aquifers, such as here, uh, this area that we call Bretagne in French, uh, which is uh, mostly granitic. This area, which is Massif Central, which is granitic and also some limestone in the, in the south. Those, er those areas with lesser, with, with very little uh, large aquifers, um, they, they have elasticities which, has, which are much, much higher than the, the area here in the center of France around Paris, in this area called Bassin Parisien, which is um, 
which has very deep aquifers, very, po very powerful aquifers. Uh, and there, there, the dependency of discharge to um, precipitation is much less. And why? Why? It comes from the fact that the, the aquifer is, is carrying a significant part of, um, of, um, of, this, of the precipitation from one, from one year to the other. And, and the more memory the catchment has, the less uh, the, the lesser the elasticity values are. So, in conclusion, um, this picture was for uh, uh, Professor Gelfan, which I know is a, is a, is a big fan of um, this Russian painter. So, uh, this Russian painter is, of course, I, like you all know, uh, Ivan Ivazovsky. Of course, this is even Noah, Noah coming down from Mount Ararat. Is even Ivazovsky is is much more known for these marine paintings, of course. And um, so, of course, uh, and how would you describe uh, describe this kind of of paintings? Will you will describe them them as uh, baroque? or romantic paintings with much, much details. And this is here uh, also a different type of Russian uh, painting. I know that Professor Solomatin likes this author, uh, this Russian painter very much. It is, of course, Kazimir Malevich. And so Kazimir Malevich was um, one of the forerunners of minimalist art. Of course, this is a, a very good Russian paint uh, painting, and this is a very good Russian painting. Both are excellent Russian paintings, but they are very different. And I wanted to, 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 to draw the parallel and, and say that we, we may have in hydrology very detailed painting, uh, uh, very detailed models, or very simple models. And I will not say that one is superior to the other. I will say that they, there is room, like there is room in museums for both types of paintings. There is room in, in hydrology and in classrooms uh, for both types of hydrologists. And they can all, uh, both be um, useful to analyze, to formalize our understanding, and also for teaching to, to learn. Um, and um, there have been a lot of uh, studies in the past uh, on theoretical studies using elasticity to summarize uh, our knowledge. And a few uh, studies also based on empirical uh, data like I showed you um, today. Um, Professor Andresian, I would like to remind you about the time. And as I mentioned, I said that I will, I will perhaps continue with some analytical solutions for um, uh, using simple water balance formulas. It was another way, way to, to show how my admiration to, to some forerunner of uh, Russian uh, hydrology, uh, Professor Mezensev, uh, and with this famous formula, but since I don't have time, I will keep it uh, for another occasion. So I will finish here. Professor Andresian, thank you very much uh, for your very interesting lecture, providing a, quite an uh, unorthodox view at uh, uh, what uh, model should be and uh, what structures to choose. Of course, painting of Ivazovsky is actually, uh, is, uh, it's not Ivazovsky, it's Ivazan. Uh, so it's Armenian painter by origin. So that's why you have chosen it, I suppose. But indeed it belongs to part of Russian culture, both of them. Yeah, right. But we have to move to um, uh, the questions. And we have a number of interesting questions uh, here for you. 
So the first question is from Nikolai Yasinski from Russia. Professor Andreasian, do you think a second derivative of flow anomalies could also give some information? As the elasticity to precipitation, for example, could be accelerated. Have you tried to find it out? Mm, no, I have not tried to. I have not tried that. But what? In in fact, um, first of first of all, uh, when you look at the at maps and you try to interpret the, the value of the, of the first uh, mo uh, derivative, you already have qu quite, quite, difficult, uh, quite a difficult time. Here, if I had, I, I do believe in what I, in the explanation, in the explanation I, I gave you in, in the relationship to the, um, to the geology and to the aquifers, but but I will totally accept that you told me, that you tell me uh, there is no pattern of any kind that you can see in this in this blue one, and here in the in the red in the in the potential evapotranspiration uh, side, I do not see any pattern. No, nor uh, I would expect to have seen um, vegetation related pattern, but. I, I cannot see one. Um, and concerning the second derivative, um, honestly, um, first, I don't know how I will compute it, by the way, from data. For if, if I was using the, the famous Mesenseff formula, which I did not have time to show you, and that uh, perhaps uh, show you um, here, so this, the 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 Mesenseff formula it's called the Turk formula in 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 France because at the same time that Mesenseff was was creating it in in Omsk in Versailles there was a French agronomist Lucien Turc that that produced uh, the, the same formula so with this formula of, um, analytical formulas you can produce you, you you it's it's easy to 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 have a first derivative a second derivative uh, um, but um, but but my answer is uh, on empirical data. I don't see how I would compute it, or I would derive it empirically. I would need uh, a Russian, uh, let's say, a Russian hydrologist to explain me how to do that. Perhaps. But, but this could be seen as uh, the part of the following approach: initiative should be punished. So we could ask maybe Nikolai Yasinski to propose this method in his when he will be giving his lecture at this school. Should Very we do that? Yes, <clears throat> please. Good. And thank you for referring to uh, formulas and other work of Russian hydrologists. We know Professor Andreasian did quite a lot of, uh, you know, bringing back names of almost forgotten Russian hydrologists in the past. So thank you very much uh, again for this. But we'll move to the next question, and this comes from Professor Gelfand. Uh, in many river basins, both in France and Russia, the elasticity of annual stream flow to annual precipitation is often more than two. In other words, 10% increase of annual precipitation leads to 20% or more increase of annual stream, stream flow. What is your explanation of this result? In fact, I that first of all, I, I need to explain that uh, interpreting percentages has its limits, and that that's that's why at the beginning I wanted to to, to leave percentage in the true definition of elasticity is based on percentages, and link, for example, here directly changes in discharge and changes in precipitation. And by doing that, I was hoping that I will always have, um, always have um, 
elasticities, or I should not call it elasticity because it's not uh, sensitivities that will be less than one uh, and not up to two, like Professor Gelfand mentioned. However, even in, in, this, in this map, I can, even in this situation, you can see that there are, um, there, there are empirical data with, with values that are larger than one here on this right-hand side, and they, they should not be. But at least they, they are not, they are, they are less of them. Um, concerning, and I will say that my, my answer will, will be that um, if you deal with real da data, not with massage data, you know, those data that where you have carefully taken all the outliers to, so that everything looks good um, in front of the classroom, um, of course, you will not get those outliers. In this case, in fact, I think that at some at some age, uh, students should be exposed with the, to real data. They should be exposed to catchments where there is, for example, we we have them everywhere, where there is more flow than uh, than there is precipitation. Of course, you don't try to you don't start to teach hydrology with such examples because it's it's very disturbing. But at some age, and I am, and uh, I think that the, if I remember the, the the young scientists I have seen when I was in, in Moscow a few years ago, uh, they were of age to understand the, the difficulties of real life and the real data. They, they you they can understand um, um, that um, we our knowledge of true precipitation or true potential evaporation, which does not exist because potential evapotranspiration is a concept. There is nothing as a true potential evaporation. Uh, but, but precipitation, it's, it's not only a concept, but we, our measurements are, are full of uncertainties. And sometimes we, we get more, more we measure more discharge and there was precipitation. It just needs that they, we, our data, are, there are some mistakes, gross mistakes in some of our data. So of course we want to avoid them by any way, but when you handle large data set, then you have to accept that th there will remain some uh, errors there. Um, coming to the, you, you must be thinking that I'm trying to avoid answering Professor Gelfand. And in fact, I will, coming to the true elasticity, which is based on percentages, I, I don't, uh, I don't have an answer for the elasticities la larger than two, and I will be glad that he helps and with with suggestions. Okay, that's good. So uh, you are muted, Alexander uh, Vaskian. Could you please click on the button "Stop Presentation" because participants asking to see you in full. Uh, if you stop sharing in the middle of Zoom on top. There is a red space to click. Um, Stop presenting or something. Stop. Yes, done, done. Done. Excellent. Now everybody can see you uh, in full. Uh, not in full, but at least your head. Yes, Alexander, would you like to, uh, Professor Gelfand, would you like to answer this or will we leave space for uh, questions of others? No, no I, I think that we need to give more uh, time for our young students. We can discuss this uh, after the school. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and I would like to tell you, I put on a YouTube channel invitation for virtual drinks. So we could uh, discuss this during virtual drinks today at 5.15 Moscow time. You all received okay. invitation. And those active participants who are attending uh, this session also are invited. I gave the link, but please don't click this link now because you will disturb the lecture. Click it only at 17.15 sharp Moscow time. But we move to next questions. And this question comes from Mark Ehrlich. By the way, Mark, thank you very much for pointing that Kazimir, Ma uh, uh, Kazimir Malevich was, uh, uh, of course, uh, 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 a Polish uh, uh, painter, 
but what were right on YouTube uh, that it was uh, Russia that appreciated first the beauty of a simple black square, which has no meaning at all. You know, these meaningless things are uh, uh, quite characteristic for some activities here. Sorry, I should stop here. So let's move to the questions. Um, so Mark Ehrlich is asking, what would be the benefits of using hydrological elasticity for water resources management? Will it allow reducing climate change impact uncertainty? So this question is from Grenoble. I think. So um, the benefit, uh, let, let me tell you my view on, on it, and I'm sure that we can all uh, see things differently. The, the first benefit is that this elasticity, uh, if we derive it from, from data, it, it becomes a kind of synthesis of our observations. So we don't need to, we, I believe that as modelers, we often forget um, where the data come from. We, we, we often fall in love with our models and we, we are keen to believe that our models are the truth or can replace the truth, can replace the field data. Um, the good thing with a very minimalistic uh, model, such as the purely linear elasticity model, like this black square of Malievich, is that nobody fall in love with them. They are just considered as ordinary uh, description, synthesis of the, of the data. And first of all, I think the... the the, use, the, the advantage I, I see is that, first of all, they can, they can be seen as a, a potential for extrapolating um, the, the, and getting an idea of what can be the impact of, um, of, climate, of, of limited climate change. When it comes to large climate changes, like the one we, we, we are um, announced for the end of the century, elasticity plots and elasticity measure, uh, measures uh, won't help. But for limited uh, climate changes for the next 10, 20, 30 years, I think that, that can help. We could, we could use them and just propose to extrapolate them, to extrapolate those simple lines to get a prediction of the um, of the of the imp of the yes of the of the coming uh, of of the coming let's say climatic changes that we can also and then there are plenty of other uh, possibilities we could uh, also imagine to um, to use them to test our models can my detailed, physical, beautiful, romantic, baroque model uh, represent the basic elasticity property of the natural system? Yes or no? Um, that's, and that's basically the, the thing. And can it, that's basically the, the advantage I, I see. Of course there are limits, there are limits. With, when you have too limited a model, you cannot, you, you can, you, you cannot um, include changes that, the, that you will not have observed in the history. For example, these elasticity plots won't tell you uh, what will happen if the seasonality of rainfall completely changes. For example, a very simple example, the Mediterranean climate is known for, for extremely, uh, uh, extreme seasonality of both precipitation and potential evaporation. And if this seasonality changes, uh, then the, the, we, we won't have seen this, uh, this in the history. Of course, we won't be able to, to predict any uh, consequences. Thank you, Professor Andreasan. We have last question in our list of questions, which I see in front of me. And this comes from Kazakhstan, from Aida Tabilinova. Professor Andreasan, why uh, wasn't the Rhone River, Rhone River, appear appearing on the map catchment dataset? 
because it was narrow value due to its location in the in the intermountain basin. So um, I did not use uh, the Rhone River because the uh, Rhone River is so heavily regulated that um, I, I wanted to, to analyze pseudo natural catchments or catchments with limited regulation. First of all, the Rhone River uh, is regulated by the, by the Lake of Geneva, Lac Léman. And then the, 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 they, are, they are very large dams every 10 or 20 kilometers on the Rhone River. That's why we don't use it as an example because the, the human influence is so large that it makes interpretation very difficult. Professor Andresan, thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, interestingly, yesterday we had in a lecture of uh, Professor McDonald, example of Seng River. So now Rhone and other French uh, rivers and catchments that uh, we're getting back to, uh, to, to France, interestingly. And if I understand correctly, even uh, if I, I was uh, Armenian by origin, you would put a, a painting of Kazimir Malevich on your wall instead. At least if you think of uh, the approaches to hydrological modeling, am I right? Um, my, 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 my approach is more like, Mal yeah, yes, it's more, it's more Malevich type. I, I must say that, but now that, uh, but I must, I must say that I did not know that Malevich was Polish. I, I thought he, I thought he was Ukrainian or Russian. Belarusian. Is Russian? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but he is, perhaps that area was uh, Polish uh, at a certain moment, so Mark Early, who is Polish by origin, uh, decided to remind us uh, about this. But anyway, uh, anyway, that's an interesting analogy between paintings and hydrological models. I think we should continue. Yesterday and be day before, we had also interesting paintings from Pomeroy, Professor Pomeroy, uh, when he was comparing a model to a lady and a modeler to a man who loves this lady because he loves modeling and such like. So I think all participants also could uh, think of interesting uh, images, graphical support uh, to the messages that you want to bring to uh, your listeners and to your students in the future. With this, however, we come to an end of this uh, very interesting lecture. Professor Andresan, thank you very much again for this lecture. We applaud you. Thank you. With the audience. Um, out of five, uh, five, uh, almost 500 registered participants, we still have several dozens uh, attending every day. So perhaps there's different people or the same people we don't know. But uh, it's quite a lot of uh, interest uh, to the school from various points in the world. Even one participant uh, from Latin America wrote that he had to wake up today at 5.20 to follow these lectures because they're so uh, interesting. It is Adolfo Lopez Perez from Mexico. Uh, so he woke up very early in the morning, oh, just to follow your lecture. Yes, with this, uh, we are uh, finishing this lecture. And of course, I invite everybody to the next uh, lecture uh, of uh, uh, Professor Yukiko Kirabayashi uh, in, uh, at uh, 3 o'clock sharp Moscow time, 2 o'clock Central European uh, uh, summer time. And again, uh, I'm inviting everybody to attend our virtual drinks. Attendance is 100 uh, people maximum because this is what Zoom allows. But please don't click on this link before uh, 5.15 because you may disturb the lectures. At 5.15, uh, you are welcome uh, uh, to uh, join these active listeners who are with us uh, today. Thank, Thank you, you very much again and see you later at the next lecture.